Celebrating the world's best dabs. Son, this is whiskey. Try some. Okay, thanks, Dad. What are you doing? Uh, nothing, honey. Sure, Dad may forget birthdays, graduations, even your fourth grade piano recital. But he'll never forget to tell you. You're doing that wrong. No, I'm not, Dad. Yes, you are. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of DadCast. I am your host, JP. Joined, as always, well, most always, uh, the man with no hair, a very, very, very interesting fellow. His name is Nick Martin. Nick, welcome to the show, as always. How are you, man? Thanks, JP. I'm good, man. How are you doing? Uh, we are living the dream. Today's a big, super-duper, extra special day because we don't have one guest. We don't have two guests. We don't have three guests. We have four guests on the podcast, and they range from... Well, they're all very, very, very popular. First, let me welcome to the show uh, who I think the main guest today is the, the man, the myth. His name is Stormy Warren. He is the morning show host on Sirius XM's The Highway. Stormy, how are you, man? Man, I am so glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, you guys reached out and it's it's right up my alley. I'm a proud dad of uh, two teenage boys, or actually a 20-year-old boy now. And I'm all about the dad and the dad cast and uh, everything we're going to touch on and music as well. So it's all my favorite subjects. Well, you appreciate that. And I'm going to love yeah. talking to you about radio. Also <laughs> joining us, you may have heard of him. He's a very little, little, little country star. He's Brett Young. Brett Young, how are you, sir? What's going on, man? I'm good. I'm good. Stormy, maybe you didn't, uh, maybe uh, COVID wasn't the same for you, but you've left out the dad bod that I've been working on for the last year. Well, I started, I started pre pandemic, so I had a head start. <laughs> I got you all beat. I got you all beat. I've been doing this dad bod thing since 2010. Okay? <laughs> Before Leo made it cool. That's why we cut it off right about here. <laughs> and of course, you know what? I, I want to introduce you guys. I do. But you know what? I'm going to let Nick handle this one because, you know, we got to give Nick some love. Nick. Hey, what's up? These are my buddies, Brian and Ben, Elvis Monroe. And we have something awesome today. We've got a brand new song that they co-wrote with Brett. So hang on and we'll get to that. But let's talk about dad stuff for a little bit. <laughs> dad <laughs> stuff. Okay, let's do the rounds. Of course, all of you are fathers. Um, let's go back to you guys, uh, Ben and Brian. Both fathers, how old are your kids? Oh, yeah. How many do you have? And tell us a little bit about them. You go first. Uh, I, yeah, I have two kids and um, they're amazing. Josh and Marissa, they actually live right there in Oregon where you guys are. And um, yeah, it's it's amazing. My, my son actually graduated from U of O. He's a doc. My daughter's in college right now. And um, it's I couldn't be more proud. Um, they make me proud every day. I'm actually going. I just bought tickets to go see them next week. So um, I'm, I'm excited. I just miss them all the time. Yeah. I mean, I'm sitting here and I left them 20 minutes ago and I miss them already. I can't even <laughs> imagine how it's going to be when I get to the position you are in. Stormy. Yeah. No, Ben goes back to bed. Yeah. What, what are you doing, man? <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, I got my son when he was five years old. So I'm a proud stepdad. You okay. know, he's been mine for almost eight years. So I'm proud to say, yes, he's my son. And uh, it's been amazing. Um, something I definitely, you say you plan parenthood. This wasn't planned, <laughs> but it's been an unbelievable ride and no disrespect to anyone else's kids. We've got the best son in the world. So he's he, awesome. He built him a skate, skate park I, in his backyard. I did. I did. I no joke. I built him a ramp. It was yeah, awesome. Huge. Awesome. He's worth it. Although I went to say, hey, bud, I got to go to work this morning. And he's like, just let me sleep, dude. You know, <laughs> so I, got, I, got, I got gaming to do. Let me sleep. <laughs> We've got the same scenario. And with all COVID and schools only part time. Uh, yeah, it's they're up to like 3 a.m. Or at least I tell them to go to bed. And at three o'clock in the morning, I go in there and Fortnite's still happening. Good God. Oh, yeah. Stormy. Hey, I have uh, two two boys. Uh, my oldest is 20 and is a sophomore at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And then I have a 16 year old who's living under our roof through this whole scenario. Uh, two totally different personalities, both amazing. And because of that diversity in their personalities, it really it really stretches us as parents, but it also just educates, uh, educates us and, and we learn so much from them on a daily basis. They're just really good dudes. And they've approached the quarantine and the pandemic in two different ways. One is like, I'm I'm not, I'm immune. I'm out there. I'm not going to get it. That's the college kid. Can't tell him what to do. So, well, good luck kid. And then the, uh, the youngest is like, I could live under this roof for the rest of my life, you know, and <laughs> it'd, it'd be perfectly happy. So that's the it, smart it, one. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, <laughs> and you're so right about the gaming. It's like, I'll, I'll, 
fall asleep on the couch and wake up at like three and there's still noises happening up in the bedroom. I'm like, what the heck is going on at 3 a.m.? But everybody's on the same clock, I think, through this whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Brett. Now, I already know the answers to these, but uh, father to one and uh, maybe one's coming. Tell us about that. Yeah, we got we have a little uh, toddler running around now. She's almost eighteen months, and uh, and then we just announced the baby girl number two is coming in July. So um, I've I've been getting all the warnings that that are the ones I think Stormy was just alluding to, which is anything that you think you learned with the first one that you'll be able to apply to the second one. Don't, yeah, no. don't lie to yourself. Forget everything you learned. Everything about this one's going to be different. You're going to have to start over. And uh, so we're, we're, we're on cloud nine, but also uh, uh, pray for us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, man, that's in my position. You know, as we, if you guys don't realize, Nick has, what is it, 137 kids now? I got to know about, yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> hey, so Bre- number two, you're doing Presley. okay. Presley looks like the Gerber baby, man. She's I was showing her off to our, our friends the other day. She's just she's just a beautiful little baby. It's surprising because her parents are not good. No, looking. they're not. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's so fun. Thank you, man. She she basically is exactly her mom, except she has my coloring, which leads everybody to think she looks just like me, but so I think coloring is a more dominant trait that people see. But when I, when she sits with my wife and I see their profile, she looks just like Taylor, which is a very good thing for her. It is. <laughs> I, will, I will agree. I'm pretty glad she doesn't look like you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I feel in the same category. You know, my lady is beautiful. Thank God for her looks. Because <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Thanks, Stormy. Appreciate that. You know the deal. <laughs> I face the radio, right? Except you've got a whole bunch of TV. They call it a cliche for a reason. It's close to the truth. <laughs> now, Brett, do you know the uh, gender or if that's even the proper thing to say these days? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's proper to say or what's allowed to be. Is said it a boy or a girl? Years, but, um, it's another little girl. So oh, right. I'm, needless to say, I'm, I'm starting a shotgun collection. Yeah. Right. Good call. You oh, should. Well. You absolutely should. <laughs> and a savings account. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. I do a lot. I don't, I'm, we're like building new closets, I guess, because there's definitely not going to be enough room. You should probably build another house too, because when they're when they're teenagers, it's awful. It's like, people people are like, "Oh, you guys have a guest house?" I'm like, "No, it's a closet." That's <laughs> <laughs> not a bad problem to have, Brett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. So, wow, this adventure in fatherhood. Now, happy birthday, Brett. By the way, a week ago today, you turned the big four zero. I did. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I don't feel a day over thirty nine, but uh, it's the reality. Is the reality is setting in. It, we had a good little trip. My wife surprised me with a trip down to Miami. It was the first time uh, that she's been without the baby. We left him with my parents, and uh, and it was a blast. And I had a designated driver the whole time because she's pregnant. So it's beautiful. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> now, when were you in Miami? Was that recently? Like super recent? Yeah, we went down for the birthday. So last week. Um, and, uh, and do you not see this glowing tan? Oh, you're right. I would like <laughs> to say the same thing, but I'm sitting in front of a window. So, I mean, uh, Irish, pale, redhead, white, doesn't get much whiter than this guy. But I was in South Florida last week as well. I took my lady down for uh, a little getaway, and we spent a uh, few days in Hollywood Beach. And okay. it's amazing. You, you, people- were, were you attacked by any crazy spring breakers? Because apparently we were like one block away from all that madness. Um, Everywhere we went, it was madness. Mm. And no one wore masks, which didn't really bother me, but it freaked out my lady a little bit. Yeah, they're a little bit looser in Florida, just a <laughs> tiny bit. We we did a, a podcast with Bossom Youssef, and he said how they, they don't wear them here. They use the mask as thongs down in uh, South. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, you can check that episode on April 6th. Wink, wink. Interesting. Hey, Brett, congratulations on number one today, bud. Yeah, yeah congrats. That's Thank awesome. Thank you very much. That was a... That was I played that song for Stormy uh, when it was just a demo uh, at the Palm in Nashville, and I'm I'm not putting you on the spot, but I am going to call you out. You cried a little bit. Oh, like a freaking baby. I mean, it was just it, when you you got to the heartbeats at the end. I was already crying all the way through it, and then you get the heartbeat at the end, and it's just like what a beautiful tribute to the two most important and now soon to be three most important women in your life. Uh, it just is. It's hard to write a love song to one woman uh you wrote it to two and it's uh, as a songwriter it's just a testament to to your craft 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah buddy. I'm gonna club on that. Yeah, man. Well, that one had that had that one had early success uh, on your show um, uh, before we had even gone to terrestrial radio with it, and it, it was like took the longest of any of my songs. I think it was 48 weeks at terrestrial radio. So that means Stormy heard it a year and a half ago. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's funny we're so far ahead of the game that when a song like uh, "Lady Goes Number One" on, on terrestrial radio, we're like, "What?" Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> but we we're on the, the third song. Yeah, you know, that's, that's actually smart though. It's kind of it, it's being the lifehouse business model. Like we were slow climbers, man. Like like the song "You and Me," I think was in the charts for seventy six weeks. Or wow, something crazy. Cute. But it, it was. It just means you stick around, man. It's it's got staying power. And people love hearing it. So it's also a beautiful thing for the songwriter because uh, the longer it's on the chart, the longer it's paying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, when, it's, when a song goes number one in a couple of weeks, that's a really fantastic feat and shows the popularity of the song. But uh, it doesn't really make a lot of money. <laughs> it's yeah. If you're if you're a songwriter that's getting those fifteen week cuts, you're like, yeah, I hope I got one following that up because that yeah. was too quick. Right. Doesn't he look like Captain America? Damn, dude. I was hoping he'd wear the back. Yeah, is, that a, is that a bear hat? Is that is that a, or is that a, a Crater Lake high hat? We got uh, it's a Cincinnati Reds hat, actually. Oh, uh, are you? I thought you were a Dodger fan. Big Dodger fan, but that's why I picked a black and white one because I have a com- I'm actually this company. I have a company, a clothing company called Caliville. So I swipe up anything with a C on it in black that I can find. All right. With that being said, and since I know you don't have much time, I, I, I'm going to get what I was said I was going to get, and I brought here for you. I literally brought this in today to wear for you. So Let me see what you on. got. Right back. <laughs> um, is it weird that I'm a little nervous? <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I got to work with this guy. He just talked. About, he just talked about masks as a thong, and then he left the room to change. <laughs> exactly. I, we're gonna. Yeah, this is this podcast is going to be over before we even start. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been gone a while, so I. It's been oh, there it is. Oh, there we go. Hey, this is it, 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 this, this is the year to be a bandwagon fan if you're going to do it because I don't think they're beatable this year. Bandwagon. Let me tell you something. I grew up in Southern California. Kirk Gibson around those bases. I was about ten years old, and uh, there you go. Yeah. I'm yeah, a Dodger you. fan. I'm a Dodger fan. All right. I didn't mean you, by the way. I meant in general. We're gonna we're gonna get a much bigger fan base this year that will go away as soon as we're bad again. Yeah, yeah, but and not me. I'm 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 in for the long haul. But we finally got it. that. We finally got that world championship, and there's no asterisk. I don't care who you are. No. Nope. <laughs> this this is my Dodger tie. Uh, I worked at CNN in Los Angeles, right there at Sunset and Coanga, and Ted Turner um, would supplement our income because of his relationship with the MLB, uh, owning the Braves that wherever he had bureaus at an MLB team, he would coordinate um, fake money, like Monopoly money, that could only be spent at the ballpark. So Dodger dollars is what they were called. And so we got supplemented our income with Dodger dollars. So I would actually go to Dodger games to eat. That's amazing. It's a story. Like Dodger dog, man. That's what I, I don't care who you are. So you know what? Uh, you know, Brett, my, I don't know if I ever told you, man, my very first Lifehouse gig was Dodger Stadium. You did okay. tell me that, and I, I'm really still, like, ultimately jealous of that and don't really like talking about it with you. <laughs> so I, just wanted to, I just wanted to remind you, you know. Yeah. yeah, I'm aware of all your incredible success in multiple ventures. Right. Some of us over here are just in the first – Band or project they ever did, by the way. Just FYI. Yeah. Well, on hey. your seventh number one, whatever. Hey, dude. Is it seven, seven or eight? Is it eight seven. Or seven? Seven. 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 And I think, like, I think it's, it's only seven. We were waiting. I think it's nine at the highway, though. Yeah, yeah there you go. go. Yeah. yeah. Well, according, we, probably 10 or 11, actually. But, you know. We were with <laughs> like, Brent, Sleep Without You went number one the day that we threw down the gauntlet and had a two-on-two basketball challenge with you uh, that day. And, and you got called at CMA Fest. That's right. Yeah, we were with you. Your song went number one, and then you went and sang it in the, in the stadium. Uh-oh. And uh, you threw down the gauntlet. It was a basketball challenge. Two-on-two. <laughs> That's and right. So oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. You, I bet you would pick Tim, Tim Tebow, though. He'd probably pick 10. To that was the first one, I think, wasn't it? Uh, uh, no, second one. That was second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
No, yeah, I would I would pick Tebow, except I just I just witnessed him uh, grab a, a 17 year old kid off of the 17th uh, tee box at Sawgrass and carry him and dive into the pond with him. So like maybe you want to be like around him, but not on his team because if that's <laughs> if that's gonna go down, and there's no if you've ever seen him, there's like. There's no way to stop him from picking you up and taking you in the water if you if he wants to do that. You're going. So <laughs> I'm bringing. Maybe we maybe yeah, we play yeah. on the same court, but like a, a whole game after him. Or <laughs> That's funny. I'm just sitting back in awe here. I, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> he honestly, no joke. He got up and he hit his ball, and then uh, there were a bunch of the wish kids there for this event. Right. And one of the wish kids is a 17 year old kid. Uh, and apparently a pretty good golfer. And if you know, the, the Island Green on 17 is the one that's over water with water right behind it. So it's almost impossible to land it on. And even even just as hard if you land it on to keep it on the green. And this kid hit it onto the green. Wow. Right out of the stands. And so Tim, in celebration, picked him up and ran and dove into the water with him. And then his <laughs> Tim's assistant that came to like help the kid out while he was trying to help the kid, Tim grabbed his assistant and yanked him in too. So... <laughs> It was not a safe uh, hole to be on for about 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. That is awesome. All right. So, so what do you think, you guys? Are you, uh, are you ready to uh, debut a song by Elvis Monroe? Yeah. Is that something you'd like to do now? You want to hold off a bit? No, sure. But I'd love to talk about it. I'd love to of talk course. about that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we've got to hear the story. The into. story is amazing. Yes. So, so if for all of you listening to this podcast right now and checking it out on the video, um, brand new song, co you know what? I'm not going to tell the story. I am sorry. Brian, Elvis Monroe, the conscious mm -hmm. yours. Let's talk about this brand new song. Well, I just remember it was kind of funny because we were out with Daughtry and we're on the bus and Brett calls and invites us to go out to see him play with Lady A. And you forgot to tell I me. Totally. We, we were getting ready to go on stage and Brett texts me, goes, hey, Bob, we're doing this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. We had a day off. Totally, too, totally, doing nothing. Totally forgot that we were going to go see Lady A with, with our boy Brett. And then I remembered halfway through their gig, I'm like, oh! Yeah. Brett. So so we meet up at this little place called uh, the Beaver Creek Saloon in Beaver Creek, Oregon. And uh, apparently, Brett, it's, it's a place that you uh, cut your teeth doing some karaoke back in the day with your sister. Is that correct? Yeah, I went when when me and my now wife uh, were first dating. She finished school in Arizona, went back to live with her parents for a bit in Seattle. So I went and actually lived with my sister in Oregon for a while, just to be closer to Taylor, so that the long distance was a little easier to manage. And so we would. I mean, if you know Beaver Creek, it's like a seventeen minute one way one lane back road, and right in the middle of that seventeen minute drive, there's just this tavern and little cafe right there that does karaoke. So. Uh, it wasn't karaoke is still something that makes me uncomfortable, but when it's the only thing you have, unless you want to drive all the way into Portland, it's just, you know, you have, you have enough to drink and you get over your fear and you, you sing in front of a bunch of, you know, strangers on every Monday night. It's no big deal. There it goes. So, so on this particular night, we, uh, we pull up on the bus, the bus pulls up in front of this place. We go in and, and Brett's like, well, I think it's karaoke time. And I'm like, dude, I don't karaoke. Like I suck at karaoke. Tonight you do. Yeah. And so <laughs> he's like, what if we go up there and we do a bunch of songs? We really don't know. Then we're all in the same boat and we're having some fun. So we bust out about 10 or 11 songs. I mean, we're talking like, ice, well, we start with ice, 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 ice baby. <laughs> we do do some Garth so we can kind of get through that. Like, you know, all three of us got, got that together. Uh, I think Brett, you pulled out some Tupac. And um, we were just having a blast. And then at the end of it, um, some guy yells out, hey, let somebody else sing. And when that happened, Brett and I walked, uh, walked away and Ben puts his mic in the back pocket. And I watch Brett's brother-in-law walk up to his sister and say, hey, do a shot with me. You're like family. You're his someday, right? And literally Taylor turns to Brett and says, Hey, Brett, am I your someday? And he goes, hold on, Brian. He's like, oh, of course. Of course I'm your someday. Yeah, babe. And I grab my phone and start putting that conversation in my phone. And Captain America himself, he's <laughs> taller than I, looks over my shoulder and goes, what you doing? And I'm like, ah, damn. He caught me. 
He goes, no, no, no. One day, someday. And that was it. That was the title. And then we just started bouncing off ideas back and forth right there on that spot. And you started writing the music about two days later on the bus. And um, I do remember writing the song on the bus, bouncing it back and forth with Brett and Ben. And then I demoed it and I brought it to Route 91 when you guys, uh, when you were playing back. Uh, guitar for Brett that week. Yeah. And I brought it to both of them, demoed it just to show it to them. And then we all know what happened then. And, but I actually met my one day, someday, the next day, the next day. It was so, crazy. Wow. I, th- I think Brett would be good at sharing like the process that yeah. we, we were able to write without being in the same room because we were all on tour or all on separate schedules. You know, we, we were working on our thing. I was bouncing out to play guitar with Brett uh, when he needed me. So it was it was such an amazing organic process that, that I'd like to hear your take on it, brother. Yeah, I mean that was that that was exactly the start of it. Um, it was it was a you know me and Taylor hadn't gotten married yet, and so it was she was my one day someday. You know that that it was gonna it was it was eventually going to happen. That that person that you wait for forever. Uh, I already met her. I just hadn't married her yet, and. Uh, and so I watched him writing down the idea and gave him a little different idea for the title. But we, this was like pre-pandemic. So we hadn't, as an industry, fallen in love with Zoom writing or really even started <laughs> doing them yet. So it wasn't like we sat face to face and wrote the song in a sitting, you know. And, uh, and so uh, I think Brian was so inspired by it. By the time I heard, you know, I, I think I did a lyric tweet on like one pass at lyrics. And then the next time oh, I yeah. heard it, you had, you had totally uh, dove into it. And I think the cool thing about it was there would have been, there probably would have been more uh, maybe fine tuning or like looking into lyrics if it wasn't so clearly something that had become your story. Like I could tell how meaningful, like everybody knows one day, someday, but by the time I heard it from you, I went, there's, that's so perfectly organically what was on Brian's heart like it and, and I think that's as a songwriter what I've always tried to do is make it so personal that when people hear it they feel connected immediately to your story and and it takes them from your story to their version of that story and then you're connected that's how you can be connected to 20,000 people at one time from the stage is when you're that authentic um, and raw about a song and so um, he took he took an idea that we had together, and you know there were a few little things here and there that I'd be like maybe this or maybe that, but I mean yep. it, it was it was it, it was perfectly the conversation we had in the bar became this song. Yep, and that's and I, I, last night I was just talking about that. I, I we wouldn't be where we are without that moment, though. You know, it's like capturing moments and turning them into art that people can relate to. And Ben took. It another step. We're sitting in the studio where he put all the work in. He played every instrument on this record. It was yeah, he's Ben's, Ben's okay. <laughs> As a musician, Ben's all right. <laughs> this guy's a monster. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you play? Did you play everything on it? Some special compliment. <laughs> well, hey, I, I was proud to be a part of it, and and was really really impressed at what the guys turned this into. So. Um, I would love to hear it before I got to run off and go dad a little bit. (laughs) Oh, that's right. Okay. So we got to let Brett go dad. But first, uh, we are going to debut the world premiere of One Day Someday by Elvis Monroe, co-written by Brett Young. You guys ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. And by the way, this is the first time I'm going to hear it. Summer in town I look up from my boots I have my watch and upside down With my guitar in hand I croon out a favorite tune Hoping she looks my way And she feels the way I do She's my one day something Glad I have a go to call her baby One day something She's gonna call me baby Gonna have a family It's all so bright Gonna wake up by your side One day, someday She's my one day, someday 
heel toe, heel toe. She's dancing in my heart. If I close my eyes real tight, we're not that far apart. We turn the lights down low, live out the same old dream. We listen to some old school country. She's singing along with me. She's my one day song. Day. Gotta have a gonna call her baby. One day song. One Day Someday by Elvis Monroe, the world debut of that. Ah, I still got the heebies, man. So good. So good. And you guys, I can't even express the gratitude and, and, and appreciation and honor I have that you you bestowed that gift. I mean, to two fat guys from Oregon doing a <laughs> podcast. OK, one fat guy. Nick's pretty, pretty ripped. And, and and Stormy for for being a part of this as well. Just it's, it's fantastic. I, I had the privilege wow. of hearing it a couple of times before uh, today, and it, it just it's so cool. I was playing it yesterday, and my wife um, walks by, and she is the harshest critic for music. I mean, I play her stuff the, all the time. You know, the people send or whatever. So listen to this one, and she kind of went, "Wait, wait, 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 who who's that?" I said, "Oh, it's, wow. uh, Elvis Monroe," and a song the cover with uh, Brett Young, and she's like. I don't know what that is, but I like it. And she goes, this oh, wow. she goes, she goes, she goes meeting. I don't know what Elvis Monroe is, but I like this song. <laughs> and she was like, she goes, thank you. Melodically, everything is cool. Uh, I couldn't help Ben and tell me if I'm way off, but there seems to be a tiny bit of inspiration from like almost a countrified wheel in the sky from journey going on. Little do. Right. Wow. wow. Little do. <laughs> you know what? I, that, that, I would never have, Honestly, I would never have thought of that that association, but I would be lying if I said I didn't grow up in the I mean, I did grow up in the era of bands like like Journey and Def Leppard. I used sure. to play the guitar player from Def Leppard, Phil, and they they were my oh, wow. favorite band as a kid. Um and a funny story going to I can't believe you said Journey. So I found a cassette tape uh when I was in high school. It was just this tape that someone had ripped the sticker off. It was a black cassette tape. And I put it in in my 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 little my little blaster, and I fell in love with this band. Had no idea what the band was. Every song was amazing. As it turns out, it was Journey. Wow. So so in Australia, where I grew up, I grew up in a tiny tiny country town where there's eighty houses and one shop. And there were there were like we didn't really have radio. We didn't really have TV or, and anything that I got. Like when I fell in love with the guitar, I found out about a magazine called Guitar World and Guitar Player. So I had to drive like like 30 miles into town and order the magazines and they would take about six months to come. I think someone sailed them on a little yacht, <laughs> you know, and by the time they came, I would just like, I would soak it all in. I'd read about all these bands and all this music and stuff like that. And um, I was listening to this record that I had no idea was Journey. I'm like, one day I'll find out what band this is. And I got to tell that story to Neil Sean, actually, we became oh, friends. Wow. And um, it was pretty cool to, to be associated with with something that's that, 
that great and classic, man. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Oh, it's it, awesome. Tell you why. It. Thank you. Yeah. Tell you why. It's, thank your wife you has so much. impeccable taste. <laughs> 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 but even even the whole melody, everything just is kind of this like almost like telling a Western tale of a love song. It's just yeah. kind of got a whole wide open space, and it's just cool. You know. You, you know. It's, it's funny on that point, Stormy. Um, talking about the writing process. Um, Brett and I were discussing the production because because it's my job, you know. I got yeah. I bring these ideas out of here and out of here, take what Brett's feeling, what Brian's feeling, what ultimately what I'm feeling, and, and make it come out of the speakers. And the feeling that I wanted, that I really was chasing on this song, was if you're on an old dusty horse, just kind of clip off. That's exactly along what it feels. Sunset, you nailed like it. The, end of the Western <laughs> movie, you know, you got yeah. the girl, you're riding off. That was exactly what I was chasing. Well, you and got it. You think you like that? You just made my day, and I think we became best friends. <laughs> well, and I don't know if you—that was the third version. Last night we finished mixing again. Tom Fletcher, who he produced Don Henley, Ozzy, uh, Ozzy Toto. Toto. Oh wow! He did, the, he did the Dune movie with Brian Eno. I mean, a lot of unknown bands that may or may not make it. We we, <laughs> we built a studio like just down the hall, a mixing studio and he's in there so last night he made some last minute tweaks for us and we just said you we let you get we kind of went one direction the first song we sent you and then all the way to last night about nine o'clock at night we finished that version right there and um we, we hope you enjoy it uh it's it's great for us we're two guys that We've not we've never been on a label with this project and uh, we've never even had management, but we find ourselves out on the road with guys like Three Doors Down. Joe Nichols has taken us under his wing and taken us out when the pandemic happened. We were out with Joe and it's just a, it's a cool thing to be able to play with all these different artists. I remember, you know, what? Uh, uh, it was Montgomery Gentry. Troy Gentry actually saw us play for the first time and cornered me in the no in doubt he loved you he was he was like hey no who writes your songs and we looked at each other and we went we do and he goes oh man he's like i there's no one like you in country music and he goes the closest thing to you he's pointing me he goes is me yeah and he we were playing with love and theft randy hauser and montgomery gentry for our very first country show and for him to come early and watch us play he stood behind the board he took us under his wing as well and he started putting us on shows and taking us out we were on core doing the encore songs with him and and we were just sad and we were out on tour when when we, we heard actually, the news we were in, we were in oregon. oregon yeah and um when we heard the news and that guy he just it was a it was really sad but it was i was really just like amazed that that he took to us so early on in our career well, he 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 does not like uh, formula. He did not like doing things the co- conventional way. I mean, when they came in with "Hillbilly Shoes," the very first song that they came slamming with, I mean, it slapped me in the face. I knew that. I, I mean, it was nobody sounded like them at the time. No and one, it, it, no one. And so, what he said is the truth. It's like I, I haven't heard this sound out of country music, and it's it's really refreshing. It's really nice to hear this. This vibe and the sound and the the, the craftsmanship you. of the, the the lyrics, the melody, the production—it's it's really cool. Yeah, Troy was important to me too. Uh, Troy and Eddie—they've been buddies for years, and uh, I actually got to speak at Troy's funeral. So it was a oh, it was oh, a really I, um. It was I a, saw a that tragic day. Uh, the I, I watched the opera uh, that day the op- at yeah. the opera um, because you know we couldn't be there, but he was he was important to us, and he was important to uh, giving us a chance. Yeah. Sure. Um, Joe Nichols of all people, we, we laugh because Joe's like family to us and he didn't want to like us in the beginning because we both came from, I came from the rock world and Ben came from Lifehouse, And he's like, he literally said, I was hearing about you. I didn't want anything to do with you guys. And then one day he's like, let's go to lunch. And we went to lunch and we have not been apart since, uh, he just hit us up when he heard this song and said, I have 20 shows. Let's see what, where you fit. Wow. Um, yeah, it's really neat. And it's, it's been an amazing embrace because, you know, we did come from the rock world, you know, the rock and pop world for me. And when we started Elvis Monroe, I was at the height of Lifehouse too. So we were, yeah. we were like, man, it was, a, it was a juggle. And for, for, for us, 
it was something that, and it still is. It's a very, very honest project. Like yeah. it's two best friends. We, we, we don't play by the rules, you know, not intentionally. We're just doing it our way, you know, and sure. I always feel on a production level and, and, and a sound level, if you're trying to be somebody else, you're already two years behind. Yeah. You know, and we just decided not to, we just wanted to do what we wanted to do and make a record that, especially with this, this new record we're, we're making, this is the first one out of this batch that people get to hear. We wanted to be really honest with ourselves. Like yeah. I want to make a record that, that it doesn't have any rules. I, I don't have to answer to anybody other than myself and this guy. And then, seeing your your reaction, reaction was and, it's and right thank- well you're on the right path it's it's it, yeah. we get we get tired of stuff that's going on you know in, in the in the genre and so it's like when something sticks out something goes whoa i what is it? that's a new sound that's a new thing going on and it, it it's attractive to people like who do this for a living and and to fans who who listen to music for their life you know they they want something that is refreshing and new so thank you for bringing it that's that's cool you, thank you. you got a you got a fellow Ozzy uh, named Keith Urban who kind of follows the same model you're going after <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I was uh I was good enough to we played the RMA awards when I was in Lifehouse and Keith was playing and I was a big Keith Urban fan and what America doesn't know is Keith Urban is Ozzy pub rock with banjos Right. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> so when I first heard his, you know, his earlier hits, I was like, no one over here knows what he's doing, but I do. And yeah. I got to meet, the guy, you know, yeah. so I just walked on stage during his sound check. I said, I had to meet the other Aussie on the bill. And he was the nicest guy. We, we chatted for 10 minutes. He held the whole sound check up and he goes, can you please come to dinner with me tonight? So I ended up going to dinner with him. He, it was actually here in Las Vegas, ironically, where, where we now live. And, um, just, just an amazing dude, like very down home, very Australian. Sure. And, it was, and, and I'm a huge fan. The records that he started putting out, the Ripcord record and the Graffiti U, where, where he's pushing the envelope to different areas, really inspire me because yep. I love what he's doing because he's outside the box. You That's know? exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, it's a, you're following a good model. <laughs> right. And, well, and, and with Brett too, like going back to the story with Sleep Without You, I was – in my car at 4 a.m. on the corner of Harmon and Las Vegas Boulevard, Brett and I were talking. We, we were solving the problems of the world, sure. you know, and he, and he said, hey, Bart, I, I got my demo here. You want to hear it? I said, I do. And he goes, they're just roughs right now. And I'm a massive Dan Huff fan, you know. I mean, who wouldn't be? From his early days in Giant all sure. the way through, sure. you know, what a monster guitar player. And it you was- know that I'm a believer. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so Brett played me Sleep Without You and then he played me uh a couple of the other tunes which have now, you know, history become number one hits. I looked at Brett with 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 goosebumps on my arms and I said, Buddy, if if the label doesn't mess it up, I think you you got hits. Like mm-hmm. I really believe it. I believe you got it. I can't I can't believe I was the first one to hear this with you. Almost a year to the day later, his song was number one, and we were playing together a little show in Vegas. Yeah, we were uh, at 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 Stoney's, uh, at Stoney's Rock and Country. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it was just an amazing, an amazing ride to see somebody that deserved it so much. And as you can tell, Stormy, I mean, you're you're, you're good friends with Brett as we are. Yeah. He's the same dude before he was. Yeah, Brett Young. He's going to be the same dude long time after he's Brett Young and amazing guy. Yeah. <laughs> he's an amazing guy and he's he's a humble guy, but he's the real deal. So for us being around people like that, people like yourself, you you're obviously passionate about what you do. Mm. You you've been around it a long time and. We appreciate that, man. We're just so lucky to have those people in our lives, you know? Yeah, I, I met Brett up in the uh, foundation room up there at the top of the Mandalay, uh, the House of Blues, you know, big uh, yeah. overlooks yeah. everything. And there's a after party for Route 91. And uh, yeah. but no, it was the ACMs. It wasn't Route 90. It was long before that. Yeah. It was the ACMs. Yeah. And we just hung out and we hit it off instantly. And he was just getting going. And it was just a really genuine friendship first between us. And that's and it's, awesome. It's, 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 it's always been that way. He's just a good dude. Yeah, and he's 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 a great friend. Like like you know, outside of music and business and writing songs, you know, if ever I 
you know, we all have those moments where you need to talk to a mate, you know, and yeah. I can pick up the phone and call him and he can be in the middle of whatever. And he'll always find time for the people that, that, that are in his circle. You know, it's pretty amazing. As, as a friend of his fellow friend of his, you got to help me out with this. He's been kind enough to invite me to go golfing about 10 times. And I've found a way to turn him down every time because I don't have the heart to tell him that I don't play golf. <laughs> oh, you better learn, Stormy. That's <laughs> simple. If, Stormy. I was, if I was allowed to speak in Australian, I'd tell you the game you should play. <laughs> but, but, uh, I'll, I'll text you that on the side. So, there you um, go. Perfect. The advice, you know, I'll send you a video about our, about our golf experience. Yeah, the deal. Uh, <laughs> but, hey, we don't, we don't want to uh, dominate this, this podcast. I know that you guys got some uh, dad talk. Going no, no, on no. between that. Dominate. What's that? <laughs> this is so. You guys are all good. If you want to keep talking, keep I, talking. Oh, no. It's, yeah, I feel I, like I, Nick, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of the highway, and, and where I heard Brett's song was on the highway for the very first time. So that was yeah. a big deal. Well, hang, hang on a second. I'm going even, to even go a step further than that. <laughs> but Brian, Brian, just, I'm going to yeah. say it in Australia. Okay. It's been a dream of ours to actually be on the highway. Oh, he, oh for wow. Five years. You know, you know we, we've always wanted to be, you know, we believe in the, that process. You know, I think it's one of the one of the few stations that really plays music because they love it, you know, okay. and and the uh, it's it's inspiring because you, you hear stuff that you don't hear everywhere else. And then you hear it later, like Brett was saying, they're always first to the punch. So I believed one day we'd get a shot. I believe one day we'd get a chance. You never know. Maybe it'll happen. George yeah. Briner took us to lunch one day. In fact, he texted us. Love that, man. Yeah, Briner asked us, tell me what Stormy thinks of the song. <laughs> and he, this is last night at about 11 o'clock. I get well, it. Now text. you can tell him. Now you can tell yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and he, I don't know if you know JoJo Turbo. Oh, yeah. Uh, JoJo texts him and then texts me his opinion about the song. And he said, don't. Don't tell Stormy, but I want to know what he thinks. And and his his was, this is spot on, you yeah. guys. This is this is a hit, and really it's cool. an earworm because I can't stop singing. That's that's what my wife said too, and I agree. It's 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 got that the, the melodic thing in there. It's just so freaking infectious. It's so good, Stormy. Then, as, one day, someday. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. No, no. As the uh, the you know the morning guy on the highway, what? You know, and I'm a radio guy myself, been doing it 20 years, obviously not at the level that you're at, but uh, how are you, are you programmer, director? Do you have any say in what gets played in rotation you know it's or like, is that? It, we, we do have a, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty strong and narrow gate into the playlist. Um, and it's a, it's, it's run by our program director. So it's like, we, we have, we could be suggestive. And we can pull a trump card from time to time. It was something we truly, 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 you know, like this has to be on the highway. And then he'll still say no. Uh, and then we have to beg again. <laughs> right. Um, but it's like there, it's, if it's good, it's got the chance. That's it. It's like, that's what I think. It's like, we don't want, we don't want to hear a song and go, oh, that's not bad and give it a shot on the highway. That's so, not, that's not the, the right. way we, we're looking I, I, for. I got to tell you a story. So this is kind of funny because it's the first time I went out to, um, I want to say it was the radio, you know, the, what's it called? The uh, radio retreat or whatever. Yeah. No, the big CRS big, big, country radio CRS. seminar. Yeah. So like I just jumped on a plane, no joke. Last minute, a buddy of mine, Jared Blake, who was played on the highway goes, Hey dude, I got a buddy pass. Why don't you come out and just come out and just walk around and, and do your thing. So the night before I emailed John Marks, who oh, used yeah. to be at the highway. The, the old program director. Yeah. Right. And so I emailed him. I don't Spotify. know him. He doesn't know me. He goes, why don't you come by the studio? I'd love to meet you. I've heard about you. And I went, are you kidding me? Because at the time we started this band, Matt Nelson named it, played bass in the band. Ryan McMillan was playing drums from Matchbox 20. And David Pichette from Emerson Drive was on fiddle. That was Elvis Monroe until everybody got way too busy and we just kept it going. Well, yeah. at the time, so he brings me in and we hit it off. John and I are in one of the studios just talking music and whatever. And we hadn't even recorded yet. And I just <laughs> wanted to meet him. So he goes, I want you to meet my wife, Brian. And she's coming down to have breakfast here. We have breakfast being delivered. 
And she's as so, tough as my wife on music. So she's, really, oh my God, Colleen is she's hard, hard on music. She 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 really is the, the brains behind John Marks. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I I get a chance to meet her. We hit it off, and then he goes, "Hey, why don't you stick around? Um, I have a uh, there's an artist playing in the room. You know that little room you guys have. Yep. And it was Casey Musgraves. Oh yeah, and she's performing in there." And I said, I have lunch with John, I mean, uh, George Briner, and I don't want to walk out on our show. He goes, put you in the back. You got to check it out. And I tell George, hey, I may be a little bit late. Come pick me up. And he goes, where are you at? I said, I'm with John Marks. He goes, how'd you land there? I said, I just emailed him and, <laughs> and I'm here. So we never had the chance to play him anything before wow. he left and went to wow. Spotify. That's an I have no way story. to even get him this So you've, so you've already work. been, you haven't been on the highway, but you've been in the highway. In the highway. <laughs> but we, we never had anything to play for him at the time. And then he left and went to Spotify and I had no way of even yeah. contacting him. Well, and you I know, said, there's like, timing for there's everything. No there's timing for yeah. everything. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great story. Timing. As a former program director myself, Granted, it was a classic rock station, uh, but Stormy, I endorse uh, uh, One Day, Someday, and I think it should be played on the highway. Just saying. All right. There you go. <laughs> we got a thumbs up right there. I love it. I, it's it's something I'm definitely going to pursue 100%. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. And we don't mean to put you on the spot, but we No, do. I, I, I tell you. I, would, I, <laughs> I, do. I don't care if we're on a podcast or not. I would tell you and go, eh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, what, you know what? I believe him. I know. Uh, I do. I do. <laughs> You know, that's all. Yeah. And, and, when and you've been doing you. this long enough and it's, it's not hard. It really isn't right. I no, mean, yeah, I, it, it doesn't do an artist any good to lie to them. Yes. I'll tell you, George and Jojo do the same thing with us. The, the, the only time either one of them stepped up, we had blue collar man. And that was our big first run. Jojo picked the song, said, go on and record it. We ran through all the notes. He was the one who gave us the notes on this song to turn it in today. And it yeah. wasn't, to, you know, nine o'clock at night. He's freaking out because we were doing all the things that he asked us to do. But to stay to us, he goes, I want you to be you. I'm just asking you to just do little, these little tweaks for me. If you just value what I'm at, what I'm saying. And we're like, of course we do. Because he put us on the radio. Remember, yeah. we were in tears. Yeah. You were crying and I was shaking. Because we went to his office, and this was with a song called Blue Collar Man. We walk in. He goes, okay, did you do what I asked you to do? We went, we think so. So he plays it, and he goes, starts doing this thing. Now go down to your car. Turn on the radio. Mm -hmm. And then he had Big D and Double L, and both of them, come in and announce us being added to 95.5 The Bull. That's and amazing. Right then, that moment, he's crying. I'm shaking, and that launched everything for us. And that was uh, four years ago now. And we yeah. found ourselves out on tour on a, on a bus. A guy named Chuck Capello, a truck driver out of Boston, loved the song, became a fan, called us on Christmas Eve, and said, "What can I do?" And I said, "Just support us, man. Thank you." And he goes, "No, uh, I got to do one more." And he bought us a bus, provided us with the driver, and put us on tour. That wow. is unbelievable. It was it was amazing, man. It yeah, was really was. Day when we bring Elvis Monroe to Southern Oregon, and it's awesome to have the big bus pull up in front of a little bar that they play at for us. That's like <laughs> yeah. the coolest so thing. Great. It's like holy what an amazing guys start the biggest band in the world, and yeah, it's like we live in a really small town. So it's, <laughs> you know why it's, it's I always awesome. that story more than most. You guys is. I, you know, and Stormy on my end of things, when we hear that from the band, how much, I mean, you guys are still so humble and appreciative of when that happens. And the fact that you're on tears because you got played on the radio, that, that, that makes my job when I do radio. That, that's, that's what it's for. Yeah. That it's, is it, music. It's an amazing feeling, man. It, it's, it's an amazing feeling. So for me, I've played in numerous really big bands with yeah. lots of hits, you know, Savage Garden, Vertical Horizon, Lifehouse, Brett, Joe, Love and Theft, you know, Tal Buckman, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think I just dropped something. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> but, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Once, Every yeah, band you've been in is what you just dropped. <laughs> yeah, but it's, but, the, but we, this was the first time that we, we trusted our vision. We did it as best friends. And I sat in my car and I listened to something that, that we truly made 
We broke all the rules. We did it our way. And people believed in it. And the, and the, the one thing that is amazing with um, Elvis is, I'm sorry if you can hear a V8 screaming in the background here. We're in, the, in a hot rod shop, by the way. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so no uh, joke. Great, great place for a recording studio. <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah, I know, huh? You sh- the challenges of tracking those acoustic guitars at night in amongst the uh, ripping V8s is, is uh, you know, <laughs> anyway. So the... The uh, the thing the thing the challenge the biggest challenge with Elvis Monroe was we're at the height of Lifehouse when this thing started taking off, and people would come see us play, and they would t- pull me aside later and they would say, "Hey, I I like I like this I, I like this better than Lifehouse," and and I, I would kind of like just go, "Yeah, cool man, whatever." Crazy. And in my head, my I'm thinking <laughs> my friends are just trying to be nice, right? Right? You know. But then after two or three years, I never really understood what they were saying because I just kind of took it with a grain of salt. I didn't really believe them. Yeah. But when I started seeing people that I didn't know showing up to the shows, I've never had seen or been part of a reaction, a genuine reaction. When we do what we do t- together in front of a live audience 8, 000, 9, with 000 people, people that have never, never heard our us. song, that are not there to see us, right. they we, sing along. We win. And it's and crazy. time and time game. and time again, you know, and to try and translate that to come out of the speakers on a, on a radio has been the challenge. The 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 twenty cent question. <laughs> it's been the challenge. You know what I mean? So it's you know that that there's that disconnect. We can stand in front of five eight thousand people. I have a video of us with Gavin DeGraw and Brett Young, and the place is sold out. And Brett standing side of stage watching these people sing along to three of our songs. They're not covers. And he's like, how do you do that? This is so cool. And, but we were trying to get that when you hear a song for the very first time and, and have them connect like that to the music, like they do to us when we play live and we're doing it acoustic. It was just us on stage having that reaction. So for us, it's, it's trying to capture that. And, um, and today was you made our day, man. Thank you so oh, much. Great. I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing the song. I'm, yeah. I'm a junkie. I'm a new. I, I'm an absolute addict for new music. It's, so it, it, you keep writing them and keep recording. Keep sending them. We will. And thank you. Thank you know you. what? We're gonna let you guys get get at it. Um, thank you for for supporting these guys. They've been supporting us for years, um, bringing us to Oregon, doing shows. They're great guys, and uh, we're helping them get even more names to on the show and like randy couture is one of our buddies oh uh, no it's, on. it's fantastic it's it's i loved it. i was attracted to it uh, uh, instantly so this is cool that, this that is they made a world thank so, you. Thank and you. i appreciate so, you guys man don't go anywhere though thank you so much it, guys please okay, hey you, you guys talk. you got somewhere to go you guys talk we're gonna I do we're i do want to just watch. you know i've been making lots of comparisons uh, the the comparison too that I, I think about the stories you just told i think of um johnny and donnie van zant when they did their duo together uh after there were success with 38 Special and Leonard Skinner, respectively, and then com- coming together as brothers and doing a very unique, very their own project, which I thought was just very cool. And they did the same thing, kind of the same journey. And and also uh, Darius Rucker leaving Hootie and the Blowfish and coming over to Nashville and doing it purely country and doing it his own way. He cried the first day he heard his song on country radio. This is a guy that sold 11 billion albums. Yeah, <laughs> 11 billion. Exactly. <laughs> and and, and yeah. he's, he's heard his songs on repeat for, you know, the last 20 years but it was hearing his song on country radio that really emotionally affected him it was pretty cool he's a sweetheart of a guy um yeah. when i met him it was by accident no joke i gotta tell this story this i couldn't make this up in a movie if i wanted to and he and i darius and i share this story i'm sitting at the house of blues restaurant here in las vegas and this beautiful girl walks by and she calls me elvis hi elvis and i was like <laughs> hey you know <laughs> She Darius is going, I get that all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She, she <clears throat> excuse me, she calls me over to the table to introduce me to her girl. And I'm wearing my welder up hat, right? I have her now. And she goes, Hey, I, I, I Elvis, I want to introduce you to my friend. And by the way, that's that's Steve Darnell, my ex boyfriend, jokingly. And I'm like, Oh, let me start by saying my name's Brian. And she goes, Wait, what? I thought your name was, I go, it's like being in a band called Hootie and the Blowfish and your, your name is, and I turn and this shadow 
is standing, a figure is standing next to me and it's Darius. And he goes, finish your story. And they said, and they call you, your name is Darius. Right and they the call way. you Hootie. And he goes, he, Dorinda hugs her. Good to see you. He was there to meet them. And then he goes, Brian, that's crazy. He goes, I, I got called Hootie three times walking through the door. Right. And, um, <laughs> And I start laughing. I'm like, yeah, I get called Elvis. I go, but being named Brian, I go, it's okay that people call me Elvis, Elvis. <laughs> you know? And um, so he asked me to sit down and I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to meet you. I leave. I left my, my card at the table. I come back and get my card. And he goes, now you have to sit down with me. And I said, I already ate, but I'm going to have this right here just to say I had a meal with you, <laughs> jokingly. And I stuck around for like 10, 15 minutes and then I left. And then I saw him do a show and I was front row and he grabbed me during the show and said, don't leave. Let's go have drinks. And I hung out with him and we've been friends ever since. So it's he's a good, he's a good dude, man. He's a great, great dude. guy. Great guy. I never this, this has been I such a fun. pleasure to meet you guys officially. This is a, uh, no, you great. too. Thank you. This well, awesome. Nick, Nick, you guys, I, you got tons of questions for this guy. Please fire away. Yeah. He's going to watch. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. All right, I'm going to throw this out there. One last thing regarding One Day Someday. Now, I have also have a radio station. It's called Pirate Radio, P-Y-R-A-T-E Radio. Um, I was sick of corporate radio and everyone telling me how to do things when I thought and knew that I could do them better. You know what I'm talking about, story, I think. But anywho, uh, it's had some success. We've got like 100,000 listeners worldwide doing okay. Uh, starting Friday, your song's in rotation, period. It's going to play twice. Thank you. Thank, thank you. That's what I'm doing on my end. Thank <laughs> you, sir. I challenge you to do better. Wow. All right. The gauntlet has been <laughs> laid down. That is great. That's right. Now, I, I actually used to work for the other pirate radio in Los Angeles. Oh, man. 97.1 Pirate LA. That was one of my... No, actually, it was, was 100.3. 100.3, that's correct. 97.1 yeah. was uh, KLSX. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, 100.3. That that was like 1989, 92, give or That's take. That's it. I, I was there from 89 to 92. <laughs> that was my, I was so bummed out when that radio station stopped. Because, yep. I mean, all we had was KNAC, which was badass. Um, yeah. And then, uh, and of course, K-Rock, K-Rock Q. And Pirate, it's just, we loved it. I, yeah, I loved it, was, it, was, it was so good. Well, CNN was in the same building and I was working at CNN and I heard that pirate moved in. And so I, they were still trying to play it off. Like they were broadcasting from a barge off Catalina Island. But <laughs> they were, they were literally three stores above me, stories above me at CNN. And so I just barged through the doors and said, I'm working here. I don't care what you say. And they're trying to never left radio, Caroline, it never left. And, uh, it was, it was an incredible education for a young 19 year old kid to, uh, that, cause that was the biggest, Westwood one station in the country. And it was, uh, there was a lot of pressure on it. So seeing the, the high level corporate tension going on mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, in Tulsa or, or some of the other towns in Southern California where it's working radio, it's a little looser, but you got in that building and it was, it was the, no joke. Now, were I mean, you a jock? It, it, no, I was actually just promotions and it did voices and did, I mean, it, this was the A of the A of the A of the A that were working there. And there, right. it was yeah. so, and I was the, D of the D of the D's. <laughs> and, <laughs> you gotta start somewhere, man. Yeah, right? exactly. But but uh, real quick, the the friendship that I formed there. Just talk about the you know the journeys through music and, and genres. Um, I met Brett Michaels when Poison was rocking, and we got to be buddies then. And it was a bunch different lifestyle too. It was a crazy lifestyle. And flash forward years later, he comes to Nashville and he's recording a country album. And we meet at the opening of Planet Hollywood again. And I go, Brett, what are you doing here? He's like, Stormy, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm working for the Nashville Network. I'm doing TV, country, country music news. He goes, well, I'm recording a country record. We should work together. I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. And so that's, it's just been a really cool journey to go on multi-genre quest with Brett Michaels right? over the past few decades. Do your, uh, uh, do you say your kids are in their 20s, college one, college one, still yeah. in. Um, do they realize that dad's a superstar or is it dad's just dad? The interesting thing is they never cared. They still probably never care, but the older one, his friends are realizing in college, it, it could actually uh, help the game a little bit. Right. You know, if they <laughs> do a little name drop, <laughs> <and> just kind of, <laughs> So there, it's amazing. I, my son doesn't use it, but his friends do. 
well, those are smart friends. I'm you know just, who I'm, his dad is? <laughs> <laughs> but no, they've never cared. They've been on every stage you could think of. I mean, uh, uh, speaking of Montgomery Gentry, my youngest son introduced Montgomery Gentry on stage at, at oh, wow. Nissan Stadium in Nashville it, it, into the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, Montgomery Gentry. And it was just another another day for him. Uh, he walked across the stage and high five Charlie Daniels in front of <laughs> right? in front of 40,000 people. And Charlie just laughed and looked at me. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't help it. But it's a... He, there were no boundaries to these kids because they grew up in a all access all the time. Triple A, as they call it in Australia, you know, access all yeah. areas. And, and it's, that's the, that's the life they grew up in. So they, I, I don't think they take it for granted. I think they're just finally realizing how cool their childhood was. Yeah. You know, same awesome. thing, same scenario with me. My, my kid was my son, my first son. Well, I only have one son. But anyway, my firstborn <laughs> kid. He was, uh, 10 years old now when he was a year and a half two years old i brought him on stage when we introduced a puddle of mud and yeah. well I, that's not something i really want to I, I got some great pictures out of it but if once you know dude got drunk and fell off the stage and the show had to end because you know puddle of mud yeah, that, that was awesome um, i don't <laughs> remember that nick oh uh, you know, uh, any show oh, oh boy uh, he, <laughs> The pictures are great, but I don't want that. You know, I'm glad he was young enough to not remember what yeah. happened at his first appearance on stage with dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got some. My my kid, my six, my, he's actually 17 now. He's a drummer at Grants Pass High School for the band. Oh, and cool. I've been a concert promoter for about 20 years. So my kids are like way into music. My daughter like records stuff and does acoustic songs. So her favorite artist is Andy Grammer. And I ended up becoming friends with him a few years ago. So every time he's in town, he texts and he's like, Hey, you going to bring your daughter out? She, you know, she sends her CDs and stuff all the time. And so she's doing Andy Grammer covers now and like they're chatting and it's, it's, it's a kind of a cool thing. But my son got to meet Matt Sorum when uh, Hollywood vampires came to Jacksonville. So he was super stoked on that. He's like, dude, we did a, a guns and roses thing in the band and I got to meet the drummer. I'm like that's yeah. It's cool. It's good. So, yeah. So it's, it's a lot of fun being part of this and kind of showing the kids, Hey, these are, they're, they're just normal people. They're, you yeah, know, they are, they, you know, they get up and they play in front of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but they're just normal guys at the end of the day. Yeah. They're, they're not, they're not impressed. They're not starstruck by any means. Uh, no, my kids are, well, not, I don't know. My son was starstruck. He was like, it's the <laughs> guns and yeah. drummer. And I, I was stoked that he knew that. <laughs> so now Ryan Tannehill shows up and and gives him a high five. Then then they become starstruck. They're a sports yeah. sports uh, superstar. That's that's their those are their idols. So the hockey players and football and and that kind of thing. So they meet one of those guys. That's then it's a totally different game. <laughs> they could be Garth Brooks and be like, oh hey, yeah right. right. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron James pulls up. Oh, yeah, I think game yeah. over. Game over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, take it for granted. It's yeah, that's something you know. I've gosh, I don't fanboy much anymore. I did when I first started doing radio and I got a big head. Stormy, did you get a big head like first year in the business? I got called to called on the carpet by a really dear friend of mine. Speaking of Garth Brooks, who used to work for Garth Brooks as a publicist, and we went out to lunch and he goes, Stormy. I think you need to come back down to earth just a couple of yeah. notches. And, and it was like, it was a great talk. It was a great talk. I didn't realize I was doing it, but uh, I went, wow. Yeah. Everything you're saying is accurate. And I think I was just caught up in m bullshit, you know? Yeah. And it's just, it's like, when you realize it's bullshit, it's, 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 it's easy to, it's easy to clear the, clear the fog and, and get back mm -hmm. to what's real. But mm -hmm. it is so easy to get caught in that fog for, for a little while. As long as it's a little while, it's all right. But then right. you got to come back because you almost have to feel that to know you never want to go there again. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you so young, it's like, so new at it, and all of a sudden you're so popular and everyone wants to talk to you. And uh, I'm so yeah. glad I got past that hump. But I was, I was mentioning, I don't fanboy hardly ever. You know, again, I made a rule. I made a rule that if if I ever get to the point where I am not starstruck or in awe of what these artists are doing, I've got to get out. Okay, because it's because I'm not I'm not doing my job. I it's not my my job is to be the conduit between the music and the fans through the artists. And if I'm not doing my job to connect those dots, because I'm not as interested as I used to be, it is time to hand the baton over and just please somebody else run with this. Right. But fortunately, that has not gone away yet. Excellent. And I don't like to think that that's where I'm the point I'm making when I say yeah. fanboy much. I don't, it used to be just, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, where it was uncomfortable and I couldn't <laughs> be the professional that I was supposed to be because I was acting like a 12 year old, right. you know, girl and the Beatles are in the 60s, you know, what? Mm -hmm. 
but I did fanboy a little bit when the vampires did come at that show a couple couple years ago. Oh, that was so cool. Johnny Depp was in the house. And my lady, she's like, oh, my God, please let me meet him. Please let me meet him. I have to meet Johnny. I have to meet Johnny. I'm like, of course, we'll, that's what we can do. And uh, we got back there. There's Johnny. And then, of course, she looks at me, looks at him, looks at me, looks at him and goes, can I kiss him? <laughs> <laughs> Baby girl, you're coming home with me tonight. And if this is going to help out my plight, go ahead. You kiss away. As long as, you know, sure. if, if Johnny's cool with it, it's fine. And he was. He got a little, he's, eh, but that, that. That star level power, movie star right there, that was a little, yeah, that's the last time I've been overly nervous as a 40 yeah. year old man. Well, I think you guys jump in though. Johnny was like such a sweet guy, too, though. Like, yeah, he was that's so great. nice. Yeah, he's cool. And then Alice Cooper, oh my God, that was, he was cool. And so. a great golfer. <laughs> there's a, there's a thing we, uh, you all know it. You, you feel it. You felt it with Johnny Depp. There, there's also a, an it factor with with stars that I mean, you could have your back to the door and you would know exactly who walked through that door just by the energy that they carry with them, you know. And there's just certain people that have this aura that I mean, like Dolly Parton, Reba, Garth, George Strait, Alan Jackson. They walk into a room, you know, they've walked into a room, and it's just uh, there's. I think that there's there's great value to that, and it's it's. I don't think they're they're. It's not fake. It's not an act. It's just they have something and an energy source that they're drawing from that other people do not. And it's just, it's what you want to call them normal people. They're, they might be normal people, but they've got something, they got an extra gear that's, and I don't know how you define it. I've been trying to define it my entire career, but it, there, there's very few people that have that it factor. And, and it will suck you, it suck the air out of your lungs for a minute when you see somebody, you turn around and go, holy, wow. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Joe Montana walked into an event I was hosting and I, uh, it was one of those things. I just went, I, uh, Mr. Montana. And he goes, he goes, do you know where the bathroom is? Yes. <laughs> come with me, sir. Come with me, sir. <laughs> Are you a big football fan, Stormy? Huge football fan. Who's your team? Uh, well, Northwest fans will be very happy that all growing up, my number one team was the Seattle Seahawks. And oh. so, so yeah, Seattle Seahawks. And even when they were in the witness protection program of the NFL, yeah. and all I got to saw, uh, all I got to see was the box score in the newspaper. They were never on television, you know, yeah. where I was growing up in Oklahoma Steve and Massachusetts. Days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was just uh, Cortez Kennedy and uh, the old timers and the boss. <laughs> well, that was, <laughs> see, as, as an Oklahoma state fan, Brian Bosworth played for OU. So when he let, went from OU to my favorite NFL football team. It was very frustrating for me. <laughs> <laughs> then he got run over by one of my I, I, favorite it's football It's one of my teams. favorite, favorite highlights in the NFL history. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> uh, Oakland, it was, uh, Raiders, Bo Jackson. Raiders. Bo Jackson, yeah. Yeah, Bo Jackson steamrolled uh, Brian Bosworth on the goal line uh, in a game. And it basically ended uh, Brian Bosworth's career. I don't think it was because of physical injury, but it pride. Oh, yeah. Pride, you know, right. Yeah. Well, I was the greatest running back in the history of the world, per, most likely. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. But yeah, now uh, that I'm in Nashville, Tennessee Titans are, are you know, tied with the Seattle Seahawks for my love. There you go. Fair enough. Fair enough. I got the Seahawks helmet here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, being from the Pacific Northwest there, Oregon, growing up there, Seattle was the only team that we had. So, right. Yeah, we had a cheer for Seattle. But I Oakland is cool. Hey, you, you know, the only time I ever messed up the national anthem was what it was two years ago before all this, I get a call and I talked to Brett and Gavin about singing the national anthem. And we all had these, these moments where we totally screwed him up. And I look in the room and I'm, I just get introduced to Mike Ditka, Herschel Walker, Mean Joe Green, Howie Long. I, I, I'm freaking out. And I got so nervous. I was totally fine until they walked up to me right before I went to go sing. And then I think I mumbled like, a line and a half <laughs> and, and then recovered. And then I told Brett and Brett's like, Oh man, I, when I, I did that at, um, that's a hot song it, to sing the Packer man. stadium, you know, like, uh, at Lambeau field, he said, do you want the lyrics? No, I don't need the lyrics. And he said halfway through, he's like, where are the lyrics? <laughs> yeah. Your, your mind plays games with you with that song. It, it does. Just, yeah. I don't know how, but it we does. Call the moment quicksand. Yeah, you know, that's exactly the, the first time it, as an Australian. I think I just like to proudly say this should have got me a green card. <laughs> just throwing it out there. But I, I, uh, the singer from Lifehouse was asked to play the national anthem for the nationals in DC. I mean, oh boy, 
or American. Triple and, M. Um, <laughs> he said no because he didn't want to do it. So the manager said, "Hey, can you do it?" I'm like, "I'm not going to sing it, but <laughs> but sure, I'll play it like Hendrix style." And yeah. He goes, "That'd be great." No problem. Not not even a thought in my mind because that's what we do, you know. So we flew into DC, and I'm sitting in my hotel room, kind of working out how I'm going to roadmap this thing. And I open the window and I look out the hotel window and I can see National Stadium, and it became very real all of a sudden. <laughs> I, I was just he doesn't like, have the band die behind. Well, well, this, <laughs> like, I'm going to get to that. So it's I've been playing in front of. You know, the biggest crowd I played in front of is 550,000 people, right. you know, so big crowds I'm not a stranger to. Um, I wasn't intimidated by the arena because we do it every day. It was just a weird thought of like, okay, this is something I haven't done. Mm -hmm. When I sound checked it during the day, I've got my tech and my crew and the guys that, you know, throwing balls around the field and hearing your guitar cranking through this thing. Yeah. It's pretty pretty amazing experience. Now, game time comes. We're all standing down right by my home plate, and they and announce me to walk out and play the national anthem. And when I'm walking out, and my band's not coming with me, and I get out there and I turn around, and all the three of them are staring at me. Bryce, Jason, and Ricky are staring at me. There's eighty thousand people in the arena, and I play the first line. And in that moment, quicksand. Quicksand. <laughs> and, and I look down and I'm like, what is this thing in my hand? <laughs> why the fuck am I standing out here? Like I had a moment of complete, like, I just hope the ground swallows me up. You're, you're, you're watching it fade away. Like, just like, oh my God. Like it's Jack just, sinking in the Titanic when he goes into the abyss. <laughs> it's like, that's just like, that's the national anthem. Just slowly sinking into the depths. Man, it was like that that toy where the battery's getting low, like it's <laughs> and then all of a sudden I get plugged back in. <laughs> and off we go. But but it was it, it's that it's that moment, but but talk, going back to your point, Sony, about when you know somebody walks in a room. There's a lot of people that have had five minutes in the sun, mm -hmm. you know. But I really believe the guys that you that you've been referencing, those those true superstars, um, you know, guys like Brett. You know, I, I think it comes sure. down to one thing. Um, guys like yourself, like you said, you got to step away when it's not inspiring to you. So I really feel it's a very, very similar parallel for for performers. Like it, they're the way they are because they're genuine. They're mm -hmm. real. They're not trying to be anyone. They're not trying to have a persona. They're just being themselves really and truly to their heart. The rest of us have created the superstar. Exactly. It's a, it's exactly. A, we've 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 made them superstars. Right. Yep. They've just been themselves so authentic that it, yeah. it maybe we're so used to seeing BS from people that to see maybe true authenticity is is uh, is that it factor that we we may I, be onto I something here. I really believe that, and that's why those people have staying power. Yeah. yeah, that's why they're genuinely they are the greatest of the great yeah. because they're real. You know, my my first trip to Nashville ever, uh, Blair Garner actually made it happen for me and my brother to go out there and he's buddy and he was like hey you got to come out because he was doing a radio show in california i lived right. in hollywood and after um, midnight yeah so he he'd invited me up a couple of times and he's like to watch people perform uh, i remember brian white i think yeah you know, he performed shania twain he's like there's this young girl coming in you know and i'm like you know, this is so cool. She becomes Shania Twain. Anyway, so I go out to Nashville for the very first time and I'm with my brother and we walk into the Wild Horse Saloon and these two guys walk up to me and it's Brooks and Dunn. And I don't know who they are. I'm in the rock world, but Blair's trying to, you know, educate me. Right. And my right. dad was a country singer. We were growing up big old Indian that we bring my dad up on stage. If you see videos of us online, my dad, we bring my dad up on stage in front of thousands of people. So I grew up on country and we, it's a long way from the backyard. But so anyway, flash forward to this thing and I'm standing there and there's this, there's this girl on the stage auctioning off her race suit because it's the Mark Culley foundation, Yep. Um, you know, for the race. I, I was in that, I was in that race. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So, so she's, 
auctioning off her suit from the year before. And now this is before Tim McGraw, blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. And my brother goes, Hey, that, that she's waving at you. She's looking at you. And I'm like, she's looking at you. I'm like, no, no, she's not looking at me. He goes, wave. So I wave. It's Faith Hill. Well, Faith Hill, (laughs) Alan Jackson sees this and goes, who are those guys? And he points and somebody walks up and invites me and my brother down to their table. So now we're hanging out with Alan Jackson and I'm like, Cuckoo's, Cuckoo and Sterling Marlin, Alan Jackson, Faith Hill, all these people at this table. And he invites us to be with him the next day at the race. And That's I was, so cool. that was my, that was my moment. First time ever in Nashville. And I'm like, what the heck? This is so amazing. And so Nashville was always good to me. And um, every trip that I've ever done, even the last minute trips that we've <laughs> done in Nashville and everything in Athens, <laughs> we get there. Yeah. It's a great town. Yeah, I think, I think we're gonna have to go to Nashville pretty soon. We've got yeah, we're yeah. talking to Jeremy and AJ pop off. They just moved there. Oh uh, yeah, Josh Paul from Daughtry. I was talking to him this morning, and he's like, he's in Nashville. So yeah. we're like, hmm, maybe we should fly out. All the cool, all the cool <laughs> kids live in Nashville. That's that's what I'm finding. <laughs> yeah, maybe Nick, Matt Nelson, Matt and Gunner moved to Nashville. Yeah, and he, you know what, Stormy? Because this is the dad cast. I gotta ask what it was like raising two two boys. Mm-hmm. Having two two boys, because Brett has two girls. Right, Brett's got two girls, and we we talk a lot. We jab each other about it too. So it's like he's like, fortunately, my girls are going to be too young for your boys. I'm like, yeah, I think that's good for us all. <laughs> it's fine. Um, it was great. Um, I love it. Uh, I grew up in the youngest of four brothers, and so to watch the brother dynamic was not a shock to me. But it's okay. just, but it could be frustrating too because you just want them to get along. Man, you just want brothers to get along. And it, it, there are spurts where they get along great. And then there's other spurts where you're just going, Man, what, the, what? The, we're all living under the same roof, guys. Come on. What is the deal? <laughs> and they're four years apart. So there's a little bit of a, you know, that difference. But it's it's been really interesting to watch. I'm just glad we haven't screwed them up. They're still alive. They're still in school. You know, they're still they haven't been in jail yet. Um, they're you know they're they're not troublemakers. They're good. They're great kids. And I, as parents, I think that's the only goal you have is to keep them alive until they're old mm-hmm. enough to go on their own. And then if you, if you do it, great. And if you don't, then I mean, it's sucks. <laughs> it's not a great <laughs> dynamic. Brothers, I'm saying it. Four-year difference between my baby girl and my son, seven, almost eleven, and they fight just as often as well. It's it's yeah. over nothing. Just it's, it gets so old, especially yeah, in the pandemic. When, when you're, especially when everybody's locked in, you know, for this past year, it's just like there's nowhere to go. Right. <laughs> so I, I have six kids. We just had a baby. Ooh. He's yeah. ten months old. My my youngest you before him. More. Yeah, yeah. We're <laughs> we'll get into that. My youngest before the baby is 13 now. So the baby is like this, has this crazy personality. He's got to have all the attention. It's just, it's unreal. And so my, my 16 year old daughter lives with me and my boys live with their mom. But uh, so my 16 year old and the baby are constantly at each other. It's like, I'm like, Emma, he's 10 months old. He can't even talk. Right. And he's like, dad, 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 dad. I'm like, all right, he's talking, whatever. <laughs> Let it go. You know, you I didn't jump on his plate. Man, just, you gave great. him a rock star name. Yeah. 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 What's the name? Yeah. So, yeah, he's like, he's a little rock star. Oasis. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, the rock star. Yeah. yeah. He, he's you awesome. Know, you know, the one thing I get asked, you know, from friends who are, you know, young parents and, and ask me advice because um, I raised my kids and the, their mom and I were not together. My son, I adopted when he was three years old. So biologically, he's not mine, but I'm his dad. Sure. And um, and then I had my daughter. And so being a parent, being away from them, the advice that I give to my friends, and I told you this too, um, being a parent, you want, I was reading somewhere that that there are 10 moments in a, in a young person's life that define who they are, the values that they're going to have, and there are things that they remember, these little moments. So I wanted, my goal was if I had limited time to be around my kids, 
and I get summers and holidays and stuff, then I wanted to be seven out of 10 moments. I wanted to, to, I would pull over on the side of the road seven and literally go song here. see something and, and, and take that moment and make them, you know, just like remember it. Yeah. Remember that somebody made a bad choice or somebody made a good choice or witness something good that somebody did and, and go, look, I need to point this out, you mm -hmm. know? And even if it wasn't mine, it was something that I watched you do or hearing somebody say. So as a parent, that was my goal. And how'd you do with that? To them, <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. But to have them come back at me and go, we used to hate that dad. Right. We used to hate it. But you know what? We love it now. Now they're like, Thank you for taking those times. Thank you. It wasn't always just fun because their mom would be like, oh, go, go be with your fun dad, you know. Yeah, go Dis Disneyland dad, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> go, go do all the good things, you know, and go meet, you know, like my, you know, we were talking about your son, one of them taking advantage of you being stormy. My daughter uh, would go, dad, please don't take offense to this, but I don't let anyone know you're my dad because I don't need enough fake friends. Now my son would want to hang out with the band and holler out. What's up, Jessica. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, right. Do, do you know her? No, but he just wanted to make sure that she saw. <laughs> you know. oh, oh, just to clarify, it's not my son who uses it. It's my son's friends. Oh, who use it. <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. Your son's friends were smart enough to figure out, hang on a sec. Yeah. That his dad gets tickets to there you go. And <laughs> and hey buddy. <laughs> the, the the last the last uh, concert I went to before everything shut down was actually out on campus at UT Knoxville. And it was uh, Jason Aldean and Morgan Wallen and uh Riley Green. And oh, wow. we had we went backstage and there's probably 10 of his friends that I was able to set up. And as you guys know, in the world, setting up 10 passes for anybody for anything Woo! is virtually impossible. Crazy. Yeah. So I mean, I, I had to borrow, steal, whatever. I mean, I was yep. I leveraged all three acts against each other. I said, <laughs> I gotta get two from you, two from you, two from you, and like try to get it all. Got them all. This is after I was at fraternity parties all day. Yeah, I was that dad. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, and then we go we go backstage and just watch them doing the meet and greets and all this kind of stuff and just hanging out. I'm like, my son is like, that's the way he grew up. He didn't think twice about it, but all his friends were like, what the? <laughs> that's awesome. Exactly. Right. That's so cool. That's so cool. It's funny. Yeah. It, it's funny as your kids grow. Like, like, like my son was five when I met him. He's turning 13 in a couple of months. Okay. And in the last couple of years, specifically the last 18 months have been super interesting, you know, <laughs> like as they become like he was always a, like he's got an amazing heart and, and uh, the most thoughtful, greatest son ever, you know, and, you know, the dynamics of, of a split home, you know, yeah. like our, our sure. home and our rules versus his dad's house and his dad's rules and the dynamics of seeing a young human from five through to now navigate that life and watching him become yeah. smart, what he can do here and what he can't do there, what he can do here and what he can't do there. And trying to have that consistency to be, uh, you know, as a stepdad, like I said, I firmly take ownership of that. He is my son and I'm a huge part in his life and I've a father figure for sure, mm -hmm. but it's been just as much a learning process for me as it has mm -hmm. for him. You know, when you learn every day, you know, every single day with a 13 year old is a new day, you know, it's like you, 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 you want to hang out with them, but they don't want to hang out with you. But if you don't hang out with them, then you don't care, right. <laughs> but, but they want to be left alone. It's like for, for my oldest you know? girl. <laughs> girl. Yeah. Oh yeah, my yeah. God. You got, you're lucky. You don't have any teenage daughters. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, no, I do it's not. Terrible. <laughs> but a 12 year old, our, know oldest, our oldest when they were 12, that was the, um, the roughest go. Um, it's just puberty, man. Puberty just will just rock a parent's world, a kid's world. Yeah. And you, you forget that you went through it too. You forget that you were going through those same exact, I mean, your synapses are misfiring in your brain as you're still developing and it's just, nothing is making sense. So it's just, j -j 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 -j. there's like a thunderstorm going on in a right. preteen's mind. And you don't, you forget what's going on underneath that skull. Because even though you did went through it, you forget, and so it's hard to interpret and hard to 
understand what's going on in a, in a I, I think we had it so much easier though. We didn't have a pandemic we were going through. We weren't stuck oh, at home. Absolutely. And we were like, social media. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. No social media. Yeah. There was like, yeah. My daughter is just like all about TikTok and everything. She can't go hang out with her friends. We're still kind of locked down in Oregon here. So sure. it's, it's a nightmare. The world she finally got to go back to school place. today. So that's, that's, oh, cool. that's good. That's huge. Congratulations. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, it's been a, a it's year interesting. learning stuff and trying to figure out how to deal with a 16 year old and make sure she's, <laughs> yeah. It's how it's kids are going to come out of this on the other side. I have no idea. I have no uh, idea what yeah. they're going to be. I have no idea yeah. what they're going to be, what the lasting effects this is going to be emotionally on depression. I'm on mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, just social skills. I mean, yeah, how, yeah. Are, how are people going to function? I, I, there's so many unknowns on the other side of this that it's mm -hmm. just going to be, um, it, it's going to be crazy for parents of young kids. It's uh, the challenge of being a parent is good. Is going up about eight different notches. Yeah. Listen to them. So it's yeah. a, it's a totally different world too. For, for me growing up in Australia, you know, like 80 houses and one shop and the bush and the beach, you know, uh, as opposed to being a parent in Las Vegas, Nevada with all this. So, so my lady took a job recently in LA. So she's been traveling a lot, which is usually me, the one traveling, but now she's traveling. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out the parenthood solo style now in amongst this craziness with the social media and the, what the kids are watching these days and what they're not watching. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and you relate back to being when we were a kid, like there's nothing similar. Mm -mm. The, the, like there's no parallels. Like you like, can't, you, the, 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 the sentence that begins when I was your age has no revel, relevance. Anymore. <laughs> no, not at all. It is, it is not, you can't say, well, when I was, I, uh, it, and they argue back perfectly. They say, well, it's different now, dad. You're yeah. right. And it yeah, is it's totally is. different. Oh, we need G.I. Joe and Transformers back, man. God. Exactly. <laughs> or, or just the stick. Here's a stick. Go play. <laughs> so, there's a tree. Go go yeah. climb it. You know? I, I, taught, I took my son uh, up a tree. for the. He was just turning six. He'd never climbed a tree. And I looked yeah. at him like, like he had three heads. I'm like, you've never climbed a tree? <laughs> like, this wasn't even something that that – was possible in my mind as a kid. Like the first thing I did was climb a tree. Yeah. So we climbed a tree, but it was, it was crazy. But, but dad, is a tree in here? Is it? Yeah, no. Exactly. I got a game called tree climber. We could play that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh gosh. As long as it's not on TikTok. <laughs> right. Right. You can climb yeah. tree on Minecraft. You can build a tree. Yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah exactly. You can Shop totally build down a tree. In Fortnite. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, I grew up. I grew up camping, in, and like you did too in Australia. Obviously, um, it's like we, we lived. We lived out in the woods, and I was a Boy Scout. I was an Eagle Scout. I was like, yep, that, yeah. that's the way I grew up, and that was really cool. Are you an Eagle Scout? I was a Boy Scout. Yeah, You're a Boy Scout. Yeah. And, and then in college, I ended up teaching wilderness survival. So the mountains and everything, that, that that's just my thing. And right. neither one of my kids, my oldest one got into it for a little bit, but my youngest has zero interest in it at all. And you can't force it. You, can, you can't yeah. do it. It's, but it's still, it's just they're growing up in a totally different world where that's just not important to be outside. And isn't it well, you know, it's crazy yeah. terms with that, Stormy? It's something that you as a dad and a father love and want to pass on to mm -hmm. your son. I mean, this yeah. is your son. Sure. And you're like, nah, I'm not really into that. It's like, ah, it's hard to navigate and deal with that on our end and not uh, yeah. bring them. I don't, I don't know what the right answer is. I've seen parents do it both ways. I've, and I've seen how we do it. And, you know, the I've seen it. Screw it. You will be into it to the point where they end up hating it. And, for, right. and, and, and then what you hope is you just introduce it enough. At least is my approach. It could be wrong, too. You introduce it enough and and talk about it enough and at least lay it out there enough that at some point the interest is going to be theirs and they're just going to yeah. go, I wonder what that was. Dad used to talk about that all the time. I, maybe I should go try that. And because it's fly yeah, fishing is that way for me, fly fishing was that way for me. I, my dad tried to teach me fly fishing my entire childhood and it, there's nothing I wanted to do <laughs> less than go fly fishing. That would just seem like a miserable, boring yeah. sport to do. And the first thing I did when I turned like, 18, I went out and bought a fly rod and just on my own went out and went fly fishing for just because it'd been embedded yeah. 
all growing up and suddenly I was like, maybe this there's some some to that so i hope that's i hope that's the case i hope just by the power of suggestion is making enough of an imprint yeah uh you know um i grew up in a family my parents had me at 16 years old and they're still together and i have i'm the oldest of four i have a brother and two sisters so family is like it's it, it's this it's just embedded in us. That's how I, you and I get along so well. His, his parents call me from Australia, you know, and you know, we're, we're just, it's a family driven thing. And I remember I raised money one night, surprised him because he hadn't seen his parents in three and a half years because he was touring with life house. His mom couldn't fly. And I raised some money and, and, and got him tickets for, which that was a lot of money to go to Australia and um, sent him, Sent, actually was going to send him home, but waited for his mom to be okay. And then flew his parents to the States to. Oh, that's great. That's uh, cool, man. Because we're, we're very family and, sure. um, and it's, it's just, it's an awesome thing. And, and I know what my parents, you know, I know the things that I witnessed that I was like, Oh, I'm not going to be like that. And the things that I witnessed and I go, I want that, you know, um, where my friends come up to me and, and say, you know, that, what I love about your house is the door was always open for any of us. There was no questions asked. Your parents would always look out for us and they always hugged us. Mm-hmm. Your, your family was always huggers. And so um, as adults to have adults go, you know, my, my wife's family doesn't hug very much, but I make sure that I hug my daughter every day because your parents hug me every day. You know, mm-hmm. I grew up not getting hugs and, and I make bring tears to my eyes because yeah. that little thing that that unknown thing of love just being given to me was what I tried to sure. you know give to my kids and it was important to me to in all those little moments you know to drive in the middle of the night because I missed them I, you know I'm gonna take a few days off I'm just going I'm gonna go be with them April and 21st Las Vegas next month. I'm giving you a hug, Brian. Hope you're doing, you're cool with that. Well, dude, you know what's funny? April 21st, I'm going to be in Oregon. I'm driving to see oh, my kid. Come on. I'm not we're gonna, we're gonna see. Well, actually, Brian, we're gonna we see you in the morning, baby. Though, right? I'll be driving. Oh, you'll be you. flying. Yeah. Okay, Ben, I'll I'll take the hugs too. I'll take <laughs> the hugs right now, gentlemen. We are we're like close to two hours here. So I'm. Oh wow. Have, you know that's it's a beautiful thing, man. That's it's this has been like my favorite episode in the history of episode yeah. date so far. <laughs> it's um, been a blast. I want to thank each and every one of you, Ben, Brian of Elvis Monroe, of course, Stormy Warren, Sirius XM's The Highway Morning Show, the biggest, baddest country station in the history yes. of all things radio yes. for Great. taking his time to join us on DadCast. Of course, on behalf of my man, Nick Martin, and my co-host, who, without you, my bud, none of this is possible. Wouldn't be possible you. about you either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. You guys are great. I love, the, I love the theme of this. I love what you guys do. It's, uh, it's great. Keep it up. You know, I gotta say, my wife was like super stoked when you hit us back on Twitter. She's like, "Oh my god, it's Stormy Warren." Like we <laughs> listen to you every morning going to work and stuff. And she's like, "So far, that's my favorite guest." And I'm like, "Wow." <laughs> so, uh, so it was awesome for sure. J- JP, Nick, and Stormy from, from from Brian and I. And thank from, you, thank you so much for the opportunity, Stormy. I know you're a busy guy, and I'm serious. Here. Keep it. When you, you guys keep uh, writing and recording. Please just keep me in the loop. And Absolutely, yeah. man. Thank you for your time, brother. And, uh, it's awesome, and Brian, for everything you're doing for Nick and I, man, uh, again, we couldn't be too. Yeah. You. Thank you so much. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact Brett Young was on this oh, yeah. show earlier. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Seven oh, number one songs, Brett Young. Yeah. Forget that yeah. guy. <laughs> for making an appearance on DadCast. He kind of disappeared there in the middle of that, that song. He, he texts us. He, he had to go. His wife said, time to go, baby. And he yeah, had to go do dad, dad stuff. That's all that is, right? Yeah. <laughs> but so Brett, on behalf of all of us, thank you for uh, being on the show. That yeah, was, thanks, that was extra, extra special. Um, I always do this on every show. Gentlemen. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Badcast. Very yeah. good. Those are my I kids. That. That's a drop. That is it for this episode of Dadcast. Once again, Ben Carey, Brian Hopkins, Elvis Moreau, Stormy Warren of the Highway, Sirius XM, Nick Thank you guys for being on this episode and we look forward to seeing you all soon and maybe doing another episode in the very near future. Love to. 
Thank you. Okay. Nice to meet yeah. you, Stormy. Hey, you Cheers, guys Mike. too. Thank you so much. Great job, guys. You guys are awesome. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. This episode has been brought to you by our amazing sponsors, Anchor Valley Wine, Boneyard Elixir, Red Robin, America's Gourmet Burgers and Spirits, Happy Dragon, Mongolian Barbecue, Chris Barnett of Barnett Group at Realty Executives, and JL Insurance.